Hello everybody and welcome along to our first installment of the GAA Museum Book Club for 2023 and we're starting on a high uh, with a former colleague of mine Dr Siobhan Doyle and we're going to talk about her lovely book A History of the GAA in 100 Objects. Um, so Siobhan thank you so much I know you're very busy at the moment so thanks for taking the time to join us you're very welcome. Thank you very much good to see you. I feel like this is an easy one for me because I know a lot about this book already. So I haven't been frantically trying to read it in advance of the interview, which is great. Um, it's a huge project. You must be so thrilled with how successful it's been and with the final product. Um, do you want to tell us, I suppose, um, briefly what the book is about and the idea be behind it and how it came about, first of all? Yeah, well, I like to describe it as a history of the GA through stuff. Um, so things that we see every day um, and that matches all the time, like um, match day programs and jerseys and equipment, um, but also lots of objects of historical um, significance. Um, so, for example, hair hurling balls from the 15th century and um, medieval wooden mathers um, on which the, the design of the Lee McCarthy Cup was based. Um, so I'd like to think there's a bit of everything um, in the book. Um, it was very important to me when I started the research that every county uh, is represented um, and also every code in the GA, so all the sports within the GA are represented. Um, and it was also, you know, I wanted to not only include the All-Stars and the All-Ireland Champions, but also to um, make sure that anyone that's reading the book um, that you know, that enjoys GA could could relate to it and could see themselves in the book. So hopefully kids, when they're flicking through it, you know, there'd be cool camps, backpacks and um, different things like that. Um, so I suppose the book came from my own background, um, which is in uh, visual culture and museum studies. And um, I suppose it, the, the idea came from when I was working in the GA Museum and I was doing work on doing some research on as part of the Bloody Sundry centenary. So I was doing work on um, objects from Bloody Sunday and, uh, you know, quite harrowing and sad stories. But um, mm. I had, I suppose I had a eureka moment um, and, and, and thought, wow, this you know, ob GA objects haven't been examined um, in in this way in a book format. So I just kind of went Which is mad when you think of it, it's such an obvious and simple idea, but yeah. I suppose those are the best ideas sometimes. Yeah, I couldn't believe that it hadn't been done before. Like there is other books like Finch No Tools, uh, History of Ireland in 100 Objects. Like there's even sports ones like the World Cup in 100 Objects, baseball, uh, American okay. sports, um, football in 100 Objects. But um I could believe the GA one hadn't been done and I suppose I was really pleased that I was the one to, to um, no, I suppose I wasn't the first one to notice this, but I was the first one to actually carry out on the idea and hopefully um, I, I think, uh, you know, I made a fairly decent stab at it. Um, Absolutely. But I, I'd like to think it's only the start of it as well, like there's only 100 objects in the book, but I collected 250 stories. There's many more out there. So I think it's only the start of um, my examination of material culture of the GA and hopefully of um, sports in general. I suppose you, with that in mind, you're so well placed to do it like it's as you say it's a good idea in theory but the work in it you need a lot of traits like you obviously have your museum background you know how to handle objects you know how to talk about them you know the importance of you know a tactile object um but then also you have a huge interest in the GAA you worked here in the museum as a tour guide and the sports fan in general and then I suppose on top of that you're you're personable sociable you you were interested in going and finding these stories and finding the the people who own these objects so can you tell us a little bit about that yeah um I suppose the timing was was pretty good as well like I started um started the the research really in like I got on the road in June 2021 so that was a time where we couldn't really go on overseas holidays so we're all yeah. doing the, the staycations and all that kind of thing so I kind of um, made the most of that and, you know, did kind of work and holidays um, 
even though it didn't really feel like that. Um, and like I did a lot of desk work before I got on the road in June. So, you know, making contact with people. And remember, like a lot of the objects are from museums, they're from pubs, but there's a good chunk of them that are in private collections. So remember, yeah. I, was a, I was a stranger um, approaching these people. And, you know, I, I suppose Ireland is, is a small network and uh, the GA is an even smaller one, but it's it's a really um, it's a really enthusiastic network. Like people just love sharing their stories. Yeah. And, you know, if I went to one place, if I went to one GA club or a museum to collect a story, I'd always come back with like, two or three more uh, which was great would meant which meant I was I was spoiled for choice um so yeah I traveled to the 32 counties me and my trusty Corolla and uh, <laughs> got to see parts of the country that I'd honestly I'd never been before some of them I'd never heard of um but it was always met with huge enthusiasm and warmth um from the people that were sharing the stories which um you know, I I couldn't have I, I I couldn't have told the stories um without people sharing them. So I'll always be grateful to the people um that welcomed me and were so open and lovely in in, in sharing their objects. Oh, we have an announcement here in the museum, so we'll just give. Okay, sorry about that. We'll probably be getting another one now when they start the tour. No but anyway. <laughs> Got to make sure they're on time for those tours. <laughs> sorry, Siobhan. And I suppose when you were um, traveling around the place, was there any standout characters that you met? I'm sure there were loads. Oh, there was loads. Like I always tell about uh, when I was in Taft's pub on Shop Street. Um in Galway. in Galway City and they have one of one of the objects is a hole in the ceiling and it's uh from when Galway were playing Kildare in the All-Ireland <laughs> Final in 1998 and the barman jumped up once Galway got the goal punched a hole in the ceiling and uh by accident and instead of getting a fix they framed it and kept it there so that's kind of you know its own little oh, landmark funny. so I went in to collect I remember uh, actually you telling me that I remember you telling me that at the time and that really kind of brought me into understanding what the book was more you yeah. know because it's not a cup or a medal yeah but it's, yeah I think that's a great story yeah to go beyond that and uh, I remember I went into to Pora Glally who's the, the the manager there and uh, long story short went in to talk to him and was still there 10 hours later because oh um, it was a, a great pub and great atmosphere and, and music and, and great people so there was lots of Bits of that, you know, I I think I I set aside maybe an hour um to to talk to people and to visit. I'm sure you'd still be there like two two three hours later, just just having the chat. So there was plenty of that. Um. So yeah, I honestly I had a great time um going around the country um just talking to people. But I suppose and, that helped the book because you you know you people wanted to talk to you. You know you were enjoying it yourself. Exactly, and it's a subject that's not contentious at all. Uh, well, you know, some parts Mostly. of the GA are obviously contentious, but yeah. um, I wasn't coming to it with uh, with the intention. Oh, oh, here we go again. <laughs> I think this has happened in every book club recording. I, so, so I, so you're, I oh my gosh. many of those announcements myself, so... <laughs> Uh, and I've left a big note down there. Do not choose the intercom. But anyway, oh, <laughs> sorry well. about that, everybody. Part of us. Uh, we should put the intercom into the next. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Siobhan. Um, and I suppose continuing on then from that, was there things you were very sad that you had to leave out, or you know, one county maybe had a lot of stuff and you had to whittle it down a little bit? Yeah. Um. Like honestly. Um. The yeah yeah there is um my starting point was always museums and local museums but not yeah. every county has uh, a local uh, museum so usually the counties that had um museums um had you know i had loads of options um so i wouldn't say i was sad about leaving any big anything out because i was confident that um i'd represented all uh, you know different parts of the GAA and no county could complain that I didn't go to them or didn't yeah. make an effort yeah um so I was always kind of happy with that um like there's loads of 
um, duplicates of objects. Um, right. You know, so, there, you know, I could have had like 20 jerseys. I could have had 30 match programs and they all would have told, you know, really good stories. Um, but I thought really carefully about the selection of objects. Um, and as I said, I collected 250, then whittled it down to 120, then trashed that out with the publishers. And um, we we got there in the end. Yeah, and the photography then, obviously, because it's objects and you're looking, you want, people want to see what you're talking about. How did you go about that type, side of things? Um, well, some t- in some cases, the photography was already done. So um, places like museums would have um, like digitization projects. So some of the objects have been photographed already. Um, in most cases, it was me taking photographs. Um, and, you know, did a few test shots and sent it to the publishers and designers and they were happy just with photographs from my phone, which well, I couldn't believe. the quality of them. Yeah, there. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the only specification is that all of the objects had to be on like a plain white background. OK. So I was I had a, a tablecloth belonging to my grandmother. Um, that was always uh, in the back of the car and like it's one of her good tablecloths as well so like if she was <laughs> still around like she'd be raging and that you know the, the, her good tablecloth was just um, you know thrown in the back of the car and I remember actually I was in Kerry in uh, in September 21 and I forgot the tablecloth I don't know I must have been washing it or something and forgot the tablecloth and I had to go take um, photographs of objects the next day so um, I had to rob a pillowcase from the hotel I was staying in. So, so it's not uh, all glamorous. Uh, no, not at all. So my apologies to the Brandon Hotel in Tralee. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll bring you back your pillowcase the next time. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know they're featuring in a book at the no, moment. No, exactly, yeah. And then for you, I suppose, this, I know you've published papers and you're used to presenting, uh, you know, in your, your job and, and you have your doctorate, which is a huge achievement in itself. Um, but I, I suppose writing a book and seeing the final pro- product in your hands is an amazing feeling like how did you feel when when it starts all come together towards the end after such a long haul of of putting it together yeah I actually have the shivers uh which is saying that um yeah like I've plenty of other um academic publications but um you know the readership would be quite limited you know I wrote it um hundred thousand words um PhD thesis that only about probably realistically five people will ever read Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it was lovely for me to be able to write something and produce something that, um, you know, that would be engaging for uh, a wider audience. Um, but, you know, it we had, you know, I'd been working from first it started as an idea in my head and then it was a Word document and then it was a PDF with all the images. But there is nothing like getting the book in your hand and you've actually no idea what it's going to look like you know you can have all the pdfs and all the measurements and the images and everything but it's not until it's actually in your hands so i had been um liaising with mary impress an awful lot especially towards the end before it goes to the printers and and all that kind of thing so there's a lot of to and fro and um but i remember uh the books had arrived uh, Mary and Press had them said we're sending out yours and um, they'll be with you tomorrow with the courier so that was grand arrived home from work had a note from the courier uh, we oh, missed you no. it, uh, your book your it's in with the neighbours so knocked into the neighbours they weren't there um so I just knew that my books were like oh, in next door and I couldn't gosh, get them. You were dying to see them I yes so then I went in knocked into the neighbours then later that night and I said is there a package for me there I said there is yeah it's a big box I think I think it's full of books I said yeah like I wrote them yeah. and they thought I was messing <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah no it was lovely to I, Part of me as well was nearly afraid to open it up and have a look at it in case, you know, I saw a typo or I felt an image wasn't right. Like it did take me a while to actually sit down and look at it properly, like probably, you know, a few days, even up to a week. I was nearly afraid of it. Um, and was the editing process like, was that difficult um, or, you know, how does that happen? Um, so I sent a full draft uh, in in February which I thought you know oh that's fine now that's the full draft yeah that's me done and but no there's I think we had probably about 
three people go through it with a fine tooth comb and it's insane like we got we had one editor looking at it and went through it really thoroughly and I said well that was done grand and then like the second one brought up a load of um a load of uh not problems but like things to think about a bit more and I think what was important as well was that um the the editors weren't staunch GA people so you know there was a few comments like what do you mean by this or, yeah because I don't you're maybe this. assuming things of the reader exactly which, yeah I would yeah. have been the same that's interesting yeah no I, I and I think that was uh that was a really important part of the editing process as well but um literally down to the last down to the last uh minute we were still kind of are you okay with the wording is of this like but there is it comes to a point where you just have to let it off. You could be editing forever. Um yeah. but you know, uh actually now that you say it, the front cover was a really long process, a really um And such an ed- important part of the book. Such an important part. And um I had an idea that, you know, I didn't want to have one object on the front cover because it wouldn't fully represent um the the breadth of objects and the breadth of the research that I had done. So then we played around with like different types of design, different fonts, um, with or without the GA logo and stuff like that. And it just didn't work. Wow. So then we started using objects and uh, we we got to got to where we got in the end. Um, but really pleased with it. You're happy with that, yeah? Yeah, it's amazing. And it's a nice size book. It's kind of an unusual size. Yeah. I don't think like I'd ever I don't think I've any books that size but um I think the hardback makes a difference as well yes it in does. that it, it makes it like an extra kind of uh you know nicer gift book it's and that gift. kind of thing yeah yeah but I'm really pleased with the quality and like the feel of the paper and stuff like that but I had no ideas or uh control over that I that was completely the publishers but um they did a, a stellar job really pleased with it Oh, it's, it's brilliant. And I, I'm going to ask you a few questions now, which I you've probably been asked five million times, so we can kind of do them in a quick rotation. But yeah. I suppose it's about the objects in the book, which is important to, I suppose, address while we're chatting about it, even though we've all read it at this stage. But um, yeah. what is your favourite object, first of all? Um, it always changes. Always changes. Today. <laughs> Today, my favorite object is um I really love the chalice, the gold chalice that has the medals from Wexford's four in a row football, um, which was the first time it was ever done. I'm from Wexford. Um, so you know, it's a special object to me. And um, yeah, it's just uh, an unusual way of of um, repurposing the medal. So the 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 footballer um, Aidan Doyle was uh, a very devout man. He went to mass every day in New Ross, and he okay. he donated his medals to the Augustinians, and they embedded them into the bottom of their best gold chalice. Um, so that every time he's used that mass, you have to think about Aidan Doyle and how great the Wexford footballers yeah, are. So like the link, especially in, in, in those times with the yeah. church and the GAA and, yeah, and, exactly. and how that was appropriate. It's interesting. Yeah. And can I ask you then, what about the most emotive objects? Is there, there one maybe that brings up emotion or, you know, it tells a, a, maybe a sadder story? Yeah, um, I suppose the one one of them is the boot lace from uh, Bloody Sunday, which, um, you know, it's a very like when you you know on paper you say Jesus the boot lace like what's that doing in there? But um, yeah, you know it's it's from Bl- Bloody Sunday, um, you know the darkest day in the GA's history, and um, Bill Ryan, who was a, a footballer with um the Tipperary team um lost his football boots on the way to the match and um he asked to swap with Michael Hogan who we now know um as the one of the one of the victims that died um on bloody sunday and uh, he asked Michael Hogan to swap boots with him um and instead Michael Hogan gave him a boot lace so that he could tie them up um a bit tighter and uh, Michael Hogan was was shot dead in Crow Park that day. And uh, Bill Ryan kept um, the boot lace Amazing. as very dark and emotive and harrowing uh, memento. And Bill Ryan was the last of both the Tipperary and Dublin um, football teams from that day to die. So the fact that he, um, you know, hung on to that for so many yeah. years. Also as well, I think another 
what another story that struck me that I hadn't heard before was um to do with the object on the front, the Hotney Memorial Cup. Um, and I think a lot of people might be mistaken it for the, the Lee McCarthy, McCarthy case, the same yeah, shape similar. and that kind of thing. But it's from Carlo and it's in memory of a man called Dennis um Hotney, and he was playing with his club, Great. Greg Cullen, um, and uh, he got an accidental blow to the stomach um, by one of his teammates and he died in hospital three days later. So they um, put this cup in, up in his memory um, at the year after he died. And I think that kind of struck me because unfortunately in the last while we've had um, a number of, of um, deaths of similar to that, like of young people, yeah. accidental deaths on the field of play. Um, so, you know, oh, even yeah. though that story is 100 years old, unfortunately, it's still still one that resonates today. Um, and, you know, just the simple, simple act of, of going out to play football or hurling in camogie and just um, just not coming home. is just know, horrendous from a hobby, um, really. Yeah. And then I suppose to lighten the tone a little, is there a funny object or what's the most unusual object in your opinion? Um, unusual objects, uh, like I love, oh, I'm going to go, well, I'm going to go with uh, the Wexford bias again. There's every other account he's done, but <laughs> I'm on a Wexford buzz at the moment. Um, but the cassette dance at the crossroads, um, which was really hard to find. I could not. Which I'm surprised, I was very so surprised difficult. at that when you said oh that. Oh my yeah. God, like I had to get onto like the local radio stations and everything, see if they had a cassette, because it's like, we're not going to listen to cassettes anymore. They're all, they've all been thrown out. Eventually got one from my cousin anyway. But there is a great story about like that, like that was number one in 96, not the Spice Girls off number one. Brilliant. And, uh, but there's a great story actually from a few years ago, um, there's a pub in uh, Sydney called PG O'Brien's and in 2014 uh, Wexford were going well the Wexford hurlers were going well again in the championship and that song was played on the jukebox but there'd be act in, in PG O'Brien's in Sydney and there'd be absolute carnage like chaos when the when the, the song. song came on so they took it off the jukebox Oh and uh, everyone went mad and there was like a Facebook campaign Re <laughs> restore dancing at the crossroads back onto the jukebox um so you know there's all these different layers and uh a link to home I suppose for people exactly in with that yeah song. exactly um that's so that's brilliant. that's uh one of the funnier ones I think that's great and is there one that may an object in the book that maybe people who've read the books have commented on more than others or is there one that people bring up all the time um Definitely um, Brian Cody's cap um, oh gets quite a bit of attention because I suppose it is, it's not terribly obvious as an object, I suppose, because, you know, Kilkenny Hurling have so much success, you could pick any amount Anything. of jerseys or medals or whatever. But um, to me, that just, uh, you know, it represented um, certainly my memory or my idea of Kilkenny Hurling, um, you know, the most... Um, successful manager and all that kind of thing. So I think it kind of brings it all together nicely. But um, there was one object that um, didn't make it into the book because I didn't realize that it existed. So I talk in oh. the introduction about uh, my grandfather. So Mammy's father, he's from Kilkenny. Um, he died in 1968. Um, so Mam was quite young, so she doesn't have that many memories of him. But uh, he was chairman of the South Kilkenny County Board. He was referee. He trained the Kilkenny Miners, um, really involved with Kilkenny GA. And when he died in 1968, the year after, they um, put up a shield um, in his memory and I mm. uh, was played for in the Junior Hurling Championship. And, you know, I talk in the intro about like sometimes objects just don't make it. They get lost or thrown away or, you know, just not um, deemed uh, worthy of being kept or whatever. So yeah, I assume probably only later you realize exactly. Isn't it? Yeah, and I assumed that shield was gone, and you know that the competition was gone. But um, as part of the promo for the book, I was on the Ray Darcy radio show, and Ray picked up on the story. My grandfather said she would do a call out for the shield. I said, Ray, there is no point. Like there's only a very small pocket of the country that will even. Like, no, it's only going to be about. in Kilkenny if it's going to be anywhere. And I thought, well, you're wasting your time, but by all means, do a call out. The next evening, 
got a phone call um, from this man, Pat Dunphy, he's in Mooncoin, who I think I'm, I think his wife is related to Mammy. Anyway, of course. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he said, we have the shield. We have your grandfather's shield. I was listening to the radio show. We have the wow. shield. It was last played for in 2018. So Callan won it in the junior or hurling league or championship or whatever. And we spoke to Kilkenny County Board and we heard your story and we'd like to give it to your family. So that's the 101st object. And oh, it's that's really, a great story. Oh, it's, um, I'm so thrilled um, that we have it because we don't um, have any material reminders of Mammy's father. Like, um, so there's no hand-me-downs. Right. The only reason we even have photos of him is because of GA. It's him, mm-hmm. you know, and with team 18 shopper. photos and that kind of thing. Um, so, oh God, I was very emotional when when I got that phone call. It's um, the power of radio in Ireland. Yeah, well. exactly. Amazing. The power of radio. And most of all, the goodwill of the people listening. Yes. Yeah, um, so to even I think bother that, to, to exactly. contact is lovely. So I think that kind of sums up the whole, it, it's, you know, a nice way of sewing things up um, on this particular part of the project. Um, and it means a lot to me and my family, so we're thrilled. And you mentioned at the start, Siobhan, that you do have maybe hope that this isn't the end. Do you have any solid plans yet for your next kind of, I know you've got loads going on in your career, but I suppose from the book side of things, have you anything planned? Yeah, the book side of things, really good news. is going to be an exhibition here in the National Museum of Ireland in Collins Barracks. Wow. Um, so hopefully um, that will be in autumn 2023. Um, so I'm really thrilled with that. I always thought that it would lend itself to go beyond the pages Physical, of the book. Yeah. Um, so that's um that that will be happening later on in the year. And uh I've started um early research on book two, which will expand um the I the idea of objects um to other Irish sports. Wow. Um, which will be a much um bigger project um because it'll incorpor- incorporate lots of different sports cycling golf soccer um athletics that kind of thing so you know i have to do an awful lot of background research myself because you know while i would have been confident with my own um ga knowledge and network that that's not the case when it expanded to, to lots of other yeah. different sports so it will um, open up a huge network for you though yeah i would imagine some particularly maybe more you know, as the left mainstream sports, people would be delighted to, yeah. to talk and meet. To, it sounds very exciting. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the objects won't actually be in Ireland. Um, they'll be in yeah. collections in uh, like Australia, like there's an Olymp- Olympics Museum in Switzerland. Um, I think uh, I think I'll be getting on a flight this time. Um, Great. And not just not just driving over to Connemara or to lovely. To Donegal. Hopefully, there's something um, in Barbados now. Or yeah, something. that'd be lovely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's it's definitely only the the start of 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 um some very exciting projects. Yeah, oh, that's brilliant, Siobhan. Thank you so much. We're really looking forward to uh, to seeing that in a couple of years. And in the meantime, uh, we still have your book on sale in the shop in the museum, and it's it's a lovely uh, a lovely gift. My own father got a copy for for Christmas. Um, uh, so keep them coming. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. Bye. Thanks very much.